Um, yeah, this is a time where people that wouldn't perhaps normally be anxious people or warriors uh, are now finding themselves in anxiety. And maybe some of you are experiencing that as well. Uh, and whatever we've founded our stability on, as Jess has said, has been sh shaken completely and in some cases just absolutely removed. Now, uh, on the 13th of March, uh, earlier this month, The Guardian reported that reactions to this crisis, according to experts, um, include kind of deep feelings like being overwhelmed, being fearful, sad, angry, helpless. Um, and also some people have experienced difficulty sleeping and difficulty concentrating and things like that. And then further still, some people are experiencing things uh, physically, such as an increased heart rate and upset stomach as well. Now, I want to say this right now. Worry is a destroyer. It's a, it's a thief. For the church, it is a, a complete thief. And for the church and for the living stones of the church, that's you and me, in order for us to function as God intends, we, we need to be free from the broad snare of worry. Now, a few weeks ago during worship in church, one of our guys um, felt that there was a scripture pressing his thoughts. And yet at the time, he didn't feel like it was the right time then to share it. This was back when we were still in the building together and before we'd really even put many measures in place for coronavirus. He sent me his thoughts this week around it. And, uh, and the verse in particular was Matthew six thirty four, which is therefore do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And, and that seems particularly pertinent as Boris Johnson has been in the news today saying that things are going to get worse uh, before they get better. So tomorrow does have enough trouble of its own. Now, this person's observation was that it's easy to say, like, do not worry, but how do we actually do that? And I think he had some really great thoughts and insight, which I believe are entirely appropriate to explore today. But I want to say to you with authority today that God wants you free from all worry and anxiety. That is God's heart for you this morning. So Lord, would you come and do that? Would you come by your power and remove anxiety and worry and focus our hearts upon you in Jesus' name? So what does Jesus mean? And how can we really activate that in our lives? Well, let's go to the passage, which is Matthew 6, uh, looking at 25 to 34. If you just want to go find that, I'll use my trusty Costa cup. That's in honour of Kenny and Len Bennett there. There you go. So Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They neither reap nor sow nor store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labour, they don't spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all of his splendour, was dressed like one of these. Now, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, as we get into this, there are many reasons not to worry, uh, several reasons that perhaps we can think about. We, we know that that's true, right? That there are many reasons that we shouldn't worry. For a start, look at the emotional impact, uh, feelings associated with it, a crushing fearfulness, feeling overwhelmed, being trapped or, or threatened struggling perhaps with anger or a shorter fuse than normal. Perhaps you're finding that you're snapping a little bit more at the people that share your lockdown with you. And then on top of that, there's the physical kind of consequences of anxiety and worry, which is raised blood pressure, sleeplessness, 
maybe tight chestedness, palpitations, even dizziness. And then logically, Jesus says, you can't add an hour to your life, not a crumb to your table, not a drop to your glass, not a swatch of fabric to your clothing and not a hair to your head by worrying. So logically, there's really no sense in it. And then spiritually, worry robs the believer of the ability to focus on God. And and so it literally steals the believer's ability to trust. That's what worry does. Uh, Anxiety achieves nothing good. In, In fact, quite the opposite. It's a complete destroyer. So we should just stop doing it, right? We should just stop worrying, pull ourselves together, snap to, that's it. Well, here's the difficulty, because it is easy to say, like, oh, they're there, don't worry, or, you know, everything's going to be okay. You know, if you go up to somebody who has literally just lost everything and you say, oh, it's okay, don't worry, at best, you're going to get a very strange, quizzical look in your direction. Now, as a preacher, as a man of God, and as a friend, as a brother in Christ, I can't guarantee your physical safety. I can't guarantee your financial security. I I can't guarantee your sense of peace. I can't guarantee your happiness. I can't guarantee your health or that of your family for that matter. And I can't guarantee for you that tomorrow will be easier or will contain nothing worth concerning ourselves with. I cannot say that. Tomorrow could well be harder. And and then there will be a day at some point in our lives that is infinitely harder than where we are currently. So how then do we not worry or not be anxious? I, I really believe it must be possible because Jesus, after all, says, do not He's not saying things like, as a suggestion, guys, try to not worry. He's not saying this is best practice. He's not saying if you've got time or if you can muster the strength within yourself. But actually he's saying, do not worry. I want to tell you that not only is it possible to not worry, but also that heaven will provide the very resources needed in order for that to be a reality in our lives, for for the words do not worry to be truthful and efficient in our lives. So let's just unpack that a little bit. It's kind of important to take these verses and put them into context. Now, if you look at the rest of the chapter, you'll see that Jesus is teaching through a range of subjects. And actually, this is part of what, what we're familiar with, if, if you know your Bible, as, as the Beatitudes, as the Sermon on the Mount, uh, as the, the, the preaching that Jesus did, sat down on a mountainside to a load of crowds. And in this chapter, he's, he started by talking about giving or helping others. And then the next subject is about praying. And then it's about fasting and then about the accumulation of wealth and treasure, all leading into this, therefore, do not worry. So am I suggesting perhaps that this is some kind of formula to achieve peace? Like if you show charity, whatever charity might mean to you, or if you pray enough, whatever praying means to you, or if you fast, or if you forsake earthly riches, is following that the pathway to perfect peace? Well, well, no. <laughs> that that would be similar to something like Buddhism, to kind of pursue oneness and wholeness and pureness. Christianity is not if I do all these things correctly and in the right order and in the right measure and then I can achieve x y and z if if that were true the the result is that I'm obviously not doing it well enough I'm not doing it right maybe I'm not doing enough of it physically I'm clearly not pleasing God enough so do more try harder do it better that's religion that's that's legalism 
That's trying to achieve by my works, by my doing. And Jesus mentions the pagans who run after these things. Now, the pagans were seen as very religious people in the section about prayer. He says they, they babble, they, they, they're repetitive, uh, repetitive in their words. They, they think that by pouring out many, many words and many formulas, they can achieve what they uh, need. Uh, and they run after these things in such a way. But Jesus says, not so you. You come to me in a different way. Now, maybe you're thinking, wait a minute. Isn't it right that a Christian is generous and gives to people? Isn't it important that we pray? Well, of course. Look at what Jesus is saying about these things. Firstly, I want you to notice that, that in his mind, these things are common practice. It's assumed it's when you give, when you pray, when you fast, and not if you do these things, when you do them. But look at the way that Jesus talks about them. He says, watch how you give. In other words, not with a big fanfare, not look at how generous I am, but in secret. Watch how you pray. Not with fancy words and long phrases intended to impress uh, other people, whether that's God or, or people. Look at how holy and religious I am because I can pray this way. But again, Jesus says, do this in private between you and Father in heaven. Keep it simple. Uh, and then he says, watch how you fast. Not deliberately looking miserable and dishevelled. I look like that most of the time anyway. But not, not doing it that way so that everyone may see us and think, wow, what a holy, godly person that is. But again, in secret. Don't try to store up for yourselves earthly treasure, he goes on to say, because it's vulnerable. It will not bring you peace or stability. And whether these riches are physical things or, or whether they're things like collecting respect and admiration or acclaim of others, like collecting Facebook likes, for example. Whatever you value will reveal in truth where your heart really is. Uh, and you can't really value God alongside any other thing. So whatever you value the most is your God. Where is your heart? What do you run after? And now the world, the Jesus sums up as pagans or Gentiles in some versions, will run after security. They will run after physical uh, security, they will run after emotional security, they will run after financial security. And, and Jesus says, don't run in such a way. Where is your heart? What do you value the most? Is it money? Is it security? Is it health? Is it respect and acclaim? Is it learning and knowledge? Is that where you value? Is it family? Is it love and relationships? Is it the pursuit of experiences? Where is your heart and what do you run after? Jesus says later in Matthew 16, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for somebody to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Listen, at the absolute best, we can expect to have 110 years, I think, maybe 115. A couple of people in history have, have exceeded that recent history. But, but generally, we've got within a, a 100 years of our own lives. Whatever we accumulate in that time has no good for us beyond this. So whoever wants to save and, and protect uh, and bolster our lives will lose everything. But whoever loses that gladly for him will gain everything. So Jesus goes on to say, seek first. This is about priority of heart, what our priority is in our heart. So then how do we get to the do not worry? 
how will heaven also provide the resources needed in order for the reality of the do not worry to be truthful and efficient in your life but jesus says seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given you as well so to summarize all of jesus's teachings on these things in chapter 6 of matthew to summarize he's saying don't make this about you seek the kingdom first seek him first it's really about humility and real humility is about putting god first becoming less self-interested and more god interested becoming less self-centered and becoming more god-centered and so that's the, the the nature of true humility to reject the natural state of self-interest and seek him first in other words, don't run around trying to look good or to show others how clever or how worthy you are. Let God do that for you. Don't run after the approval of others. Don't do stuff thinking it's like a puzzle that you have to put together in the right order and complete in order to get a prize, like gain the blessing. God doesn't follow formula to give you blessing. He blesses out of his abundance. So seek him, seek his presence, listen for his voice, learn of his character, in, enjoy him, delight in him. That's where the blessing is and that's where the peace is. You, you'll discover if you can do that, that there is no limit to his faithfulness, no, no way to fathom his love for you, no way to put boundaries around his grace, that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from heaven a pardon receives nobody is beyond the reach of grace. And for that reason, therefore, this is the therefore that we find in scripture, for that reason, be anxious for nothing. If my focus is on him, then I'm not worried about what others think about me. I'm not worried about my performance. I, I know that even in hunger, there is contentment. I know that even in the valley of the shadow, there is no evil to be feared because God is my rear guard and my defender. I know that there is imperishable treasure in heaven when I press into his presence. And I know that there is perfect peace which reaches beyond logic. Now, logic at the moment would say be anxious. I've experienced this over the last few weeks as well, probably as you have. And logic would say that's reasonable, rational and normal human response to crisis. But, but you see, God's peace goes beyond our logic, goes beyond our comprehension and beyond our understanding. Now, anything, guys, that we put before God means that we're not trusting in him. Uh, and actually trusting in him is the only route to perfect peace and hence then the ability not to worry. Isaiah 26 says, you will keep in perfect peace. Who? Those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord himself is the rock eternal. The rock will not be moved. The rock cannot be shaken. The rock cannot be cracked or broken. The rock is immovable. You can put your full trust in the rock. You can dig your anchor into the rock of Jesus Christ. And in doing that, in trusting him, he will keep you in perfect peace. So seeking him is all about learning to trust him. And in trusting him, learning that there's nothing that can shake or separate us from his love or, or from his purposes for us. Seeking him is about finding out that he's utterly dependable, unshakably faithful, unrelentingly good. 
that, that he feeds the birds and he clothes the fields and yet he values you all the more highly. That's not saying that he doesn't value the birds. God loves everything that he's created. He, he values them enough that he provides for them, that he feeds for them and their dawn chorus is praise to his name just by being his creation. And yet he values you more than that. And look at the, the, the flowers of the field and the, the splendour, particularly springtime as we see the world coming back to life. Uh, and know that God values you, sees you as more beautiful, more precious than the most precious, beautiful flower. So as I wrap up, my question is, why do I find myself anxious? And in truth, I do often. I want to be realistic with you guys. It's because seeking him, if I'm honest, is is all too often the second or the third thing that I do. Uh, and often even then, only when I've exhausted every other resource that I have. What a foolish man I am. When will I learn that if I can seek him first, position myself in his presence, rest and not not yield, not move until I know that he is there. If I can do that, then there is perfect peace. But the thing is, like the vine and the branch, we need to be daily connected. That fruit doesn't just grow as we go about our own business in our own way, in our own styles. That that only happens by being connected as a branch to the vine. That's the only way that fruit grows in our lives. And so for the fruit of peace to be growing in our lives, we need to be spending time connected to the vine. In fact, it's not just about time connected. It's about being connected all of the time. Now daily I find that my mind drifts uh, and wanders and that's normal and you will find the same thing too. So daily I need to position myself again, whatever way I do that, to spend time in his presence and wait there until I know that he's speaking. Wait there until I know that I feel his presence and know his heart pouring out to mine, know his peace settling and resting beyond all the circumstances. So guys, stop looking elsewhere for security. Don't look to the news, don't look to the government, don't look to your bank account, don't look to your neighbours for your security or for validation. Look to him, seek him first, seek him only, seek him now. Seek him like we're all currently washing our hands. Regularly wash, rinse, repeat.